Welcome once again to On The Money, your daily weekday dose of economics, business and consumer news. I'm Liam Halligan, and for the next hour, we'll be talking about that decision by the Bank of England to raise interest rates from 0.1% to 0.25%, a bid to combat inflation. It's a big economic story, one which will hit every firm and household in the country. So join me here on The Money, after the GB News headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Liam, thank you. Here are the top stories at one o'clock. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to the rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those that can enter will also have to self-isolate for seven days, but isolation will be lifted after 48 hours if their test is negative. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.25% from 0.1%. Eight out of the nine committee members voted in favour of the move. Rates had been cut to a record low of 0.1% in March last year at the start of the pandemic. And we'll have a full reaction and analysis for you in the next half an hour with Liam on the money. The chief medical officer has warned people to deprioritise certain social events ahead of Christmas to help prevent against the spread of coronavirus. On Wednesday, daily COVID cases hit over 78,000, the highest since the pandemic began. Professor Chris Whitty warned that multiple records will be broken over the coming weeks as the Omicron variant surges in the UK. Anybody who has something that really matters to them, concentrate on that thing and then build out from there, rather than just accepting every invitation and going to every bit of work uh, in person. Clinical studies are showing that lots of people are getting reinfected uh, with Omicron who previously had been vaccinated or had a combination of vaccines and natural infection. So it definitely is likely to bypass some of the ability to reduce, in, uh, reduce infection. Chancellor Rishi Sunak is to hold talks with representatives of the hospitality sector seeking further government support after the emergence of the Omicron variant. Some in the industry are predicting significant falls in footfall in December as COVID cases rise. Many customers are now avoiding socialising in the build-up to Christmas over fears of having to isolate. Business groups are calling for an extension of the VAT reduction, which is due to end in March, and for business rates to be deferred. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many people's Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. A man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Kochi Selamaj killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The prosecution alleged he travelled to London from his home in Eastbourne to carry out a premeditated and predatory attack. He'll face a further hearing in February. Two people are missing after a block of flats was gutted by fire in a suspected arson attack. After an extensive search, Thames Valley Police say it doesn't expect there to be any more survivors. One person has been confirmed dead after the blaze. A 31-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. At least four children have died and more are badly injured in Australia after strong winds lifted a bouncy castle during end-of-year school celebrations. Two boys and two girls in their final year of primary school died in Tasmania after the children's ride flew away causing them to fall 10 metres. Five more children are in hospital, including one in a serious condition. UK authorities are responding to several incidents involving small boats in the English Channel. Border force and lifeboats have already intercepted several inflatables and landed more than 100 people in Dover this morning. Our home and security editor Mark White witnessed the latest arrival of migrants at Dover Harbour. This is another day of significant migrant activity uh, in the channel and that the reason for that is the conditions are very calm out in the channel at the moment. We've had about 10 days of pretty atrocious weather where no small boats have been able to make it across. But now that weather conditions have improved, there's a window of about two or three days, we're expecting a lot of migrant activity. 
Mark Wright reporting there. Well, those are the top stories. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now let's return to On The Money. And this is On The Money. Today we're dedicating almost our entire show to interest rates. After the Bank of England decided this lunchtime to raise rates for the first time in over three years. We'll be discussing what that means for your savings, mortgage and for the broader economy. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the Bank of England's move to raise interest rates from 0.1 to 0.25%? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. We'll read some of your emails and messages later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan. You're on the money. So the Bank of England this lunchtime raised interest rates from 0.1 to 0.25%. This is a major economic story, one which will impact households and firms across the country. So pin back your ears. In and of itself, this is a tiny interest rate rise from just one-tenth of one percent to one-quarter of one percent. Compare that with interest rates of three, five, even ten percent or more back in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. And borrowing costs these days are still extremely low. Having said that, the Bank of England just became the first major central bank in the world to raise interest rates in response to this latest surge in inflation. It's a move that will be noticed around the world, not least by the mighty US central bank, the Federal Reserve, and other large central banks will likely follow. Here in the UK, the consumer price index was 5.1% higher in November than the same month in 2020. Inflation is now at a 10-year high and more than two and a half times the Bank of England's 2% target. That November number was up on October, when inflation was 4.2%, which itself was higher than September's 3.1% inflation figure. So price pressures have been building here in the UK for some time and elsewhere. In the US, headline inflation just hit 6.8%. And on both sides of the Atlantic, measures of producer price inflation, the costs firms and factories pay for their inputs, are rising even more. Now, the Bank of England's just raised rates, even though the economy will likely be hit quite severely by these latest Plan B anti-COVID restrictions. Already, the hospitality industry, which employs around a tenth of the workforce, is feeling the impact of these new measures. Yet, price pressures across the economy are huge, not least due to supply chain issues. Factory closures during lockdown, particularly in the Far East, have generated an acute shortage of microprocessors, for instance which has reduced the supply of new cars, meaning the price of used cars is soaring, as any dealer will tell you. Energy prices are also sky high for both households and firms, given the spiralling cost of wholesale gas. Yet despite all that, with headline inflation so far above target, the Bank of England simply couldn't afford not to act today, as On The Money predicted earlier this week. To not raise interest rates when CPI inflation exceeds 5%, would have given the impression the Bank of England has pretty much given up fighting price pressures, seriously damaging its credibility, and that would have caused inflation to rise even more. So now, after a decade or more of falling rates worldwide, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, the global interest rate trend, the cycle, just turned upwards after the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee voted 8 to 1 to raise rates, even if, pretty controversially, the same MPC economists voted 9-0 to maintain the bank's quantitative easing money printing programme. But from now on, borrowing is likely to get more expensive, while returns on savings will also gradually go up. And that's our on-the-money question today. UK interest rates, how high could they go? As ever here on The Money, stand by for a grown-up conversation with people who really know their stuff. Joining me is Lee Wild, Head of Equity Strategy at The Interactive Investor. Good to see you, Lee. With me in the studio, not one but two On The Money regulars. It's Vicky Price, Chief Economist, Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economic and Business Research, former co-head of the Government Economic Service, and, of course, the Money Magpie herself, it's Jasmine Bertels, talking about all things personal finance. Great to see you both. Let's go to you, Lee, first. You are 
a, a, a markets man, if you like, you work for an investment company. What I've noticed in the last few moments, really, since the Bank of England raised interest rates, is the pound has spiked against the dollar, which suggests the market didn't think this was coming. The market had convinced itself the bank was going to hold fire once more. Um, yeah, absolutely. Do. Not a great Christmas present. Um, I, th I think that it was a 50-50 um, I think is the uh, the odds you would have got um, prior to today. I think with um, Omicron uh, numbers hitting uh, record highs and uh, you know, the COVID um, and pandemic um, showing no signs of going away, I think people thought that maybe we wouldn't see an interest rate increase until uh, February. Um, obviously, we've got a, it's just only a small increase. I mean, that's the, the thing to bear in mind, I think. And uh, I think probably people aren't, aren't anticipating uh, um, you know, a, a, a prolonged, a protracted rate tightening cycle at the moment. Jasmine, straight to you for what it means for our purses and our wallets. It's a small interest rate rise, as, as I stressed at the top and as Lee Wilde has just confirmed, but it still means the global interest rate cycle's turning. Yeah, absolutely. It's a psychological and, and practical thing. As you say, I mean, America is already considering this, saying that they're going to be putting rates up. So that'll be interesting. I'm sure the EU and various other Western banks will, will follow. The European Central Bank, so, which runs the Eurozone. Bank. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, already we've seen that the, the mortgage companies, and this happened last month, mortgage companies pulled their, their cheapest mortgages. It always happens. Every time you get a rate rise, um, the mortgages all go, oh, right, you know, We'll, we'll get rid. You know, we'll put our rates up immediately. Yeah. But the savings. I mean, back in two, twenty. Yeah, the savings rates don't go up. I don't, I no, why that is. I can't I even imagine. Why that is. Oh, who would have thought? So, <laughs> <laughs> back in 2018, when we had a rate rise, one in ten, only one in ten banks actually finally put put the rates up within you know about a week, and and then the other sort of very gradually, and and hardly any put it up by the full amount. So, yeah, I think this is going to be slightly good for savers, but certainly borrowers will see the difference, yeah. Vicky, what do you make of this? You're, you're a, a, a well-known Bank of England watcher. I'm surprised, <laughs> I must say, by... Not that rates went up. We predicted it here on the money that the Bank of England couldn't afford not to raise rates, uh, even if the rest of the market or some of the market didn't agree with us. But I'm surprised not by the rate rise, but the fact that quantitative easing is going to be maintained, so expanding the money supply, keeping monetary policy loose, while interest rates are going up, which is to tighten monetary policy, it doesn't seem to intellectually stack up to me. Well, that's true, but of course there isn't an awful lot more quantitative easing that can take place. They're practically exhausted what there is, and I think there's only about 50 billion left. Yeah, under the current can... yes, under 895 the... yes. billion pound program. But of course they might, you know, decide to spend a little bit more. But what we're seeing is that the other central banks are certainly moving to reduce their own quantitative easing. Remember, quantitative easing has been very significant in terms of keeping interest rates low generally, mm -hmm. because of course you're looking at longer term uh, yields there. So if they're involved in the market and buying bonds in the secondary market, that keeps yields quite low, on which loads of mortgages and so on are based. And the interesting thing is that yields right now in uh, the UK are still below 1%. Let's well, just unpack that, Vicky, because I really want a lot of our viewers are specialist people. We've got Lee Wilde here. Many investors are starting to watch the programme, as we know. But people sitting at home, this isn't their world. What you're saying is this Bank of England money printing, quantitative easing that we call it, a lot of that money has been used by the Bank of England to buy government bonds. Mm. And if it buys government bonds, it keeps the yield on those bonds, the interest rate the government must pay to borrow, almost artificially low because the Bank of England is a customer buying the bonds rather than financial markets but buying the bonds. Now, if quantitative easing is going to carry on for another few tens of billions, we know now, but when back that quantitative easing stops altogether, what you're saying is that government borrowing costs might then spike upward. Absolutely. For the moment, they're not spiking up. It yeah. seems, if anything, they've gone down a little bit, and that is, of course, because quantitative easing is carrying on. So what's happening, of course, is not that the bank is buying those bonds instead of financial institutions or others. It's they, financial institutions and others, buy them first, then the bank comes in and buys them back from them. And doing so, it increases the price and reduces the yield, because remember, these are fixed interest bonds. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, the yield is really what you get on, by comparison to the price of that particular bond. So if the bond price going up, 
the yield, which is fixed in terms of interest rate, the yield goes down, and that's good news. It has been very important in funding, if you want to call it that, inverted commas, government spending, because that's right. you know, without that stimulus that we've all seen, whether it's UK, US, the European Central Bank, we would not have had the recovery that we've seen in the economy. Without QE, you're saying, Vicky, your argument, government spending would, wouldn't have been as high as it's been because governments wouldn't have been able to borrow so cheaply and taxation might have been higher in order to meet those higher borrowing costs. We'll see what happens when QE ends. Let's go back to you, Lee. From a market perspective, I think we were all surprised. The market certainly took umbrage when the Bank of England didn't raise rates last month, but a lot of people in the markets figured that they wouldn't Put, impose an interest rate rise just before Christmas, particularly once Omicron uh, uh, Plan B uh, stipulations and, and regulations were announced by the government. What do you think it is that's made the Bank of England once again, not trick, but certainly um, uh, uh, sidestep market expectations? Well, I, th I think they've seen um, yeah, the, the strength of the data, especially on uh, on the jobs market and growth today that we've seen. Um, I, th I think it's given them the confidence to go ahead and um, you know, pull the trigger. Um, I, I, it also gives market watchers confidence in the um, in the in the strength of the economy. Um, if the Bank of England is is prepared to uh, to go before Christmas, then um, yeah, that that reflects well on on, on that that view of. Um, uh, of, of the, you know, the local the domestic economy, at least. Um, I mean, we saw a similar thing in, in the US last night. The um, uh, you know, that that new dot plot, that, that sort of forecast for for interest rate rises next year, uh, and the uh, the markets responded positively. And we've seen while we saw the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250 fall um, on the news today. Um, we also see, saw some of the perhaps more vulnerable um, sectors, vulnerable stocks. House, some of the house builder stocks fell um, on the news initially, um, one or two of the, uh, the supermarkets and some other sectors, but bounced back very quickly. So well, I think there was that initial response where they thought this is bad news, but then it took some time to, uh, to think again and um, have taken it more positive. Banks as, of, obviously have done it incredibly well, as, as one would expect. Lee, that's very, very interesting. I've been thinking for, for some time, for, for months and even years, in fact, despite all the doom and gloom from financial analysts, oh, if we raise rates, financial markets will collapse, yada, yada, yada. I've written many times that actually if you raise rates, wise heads in financial markets will think, ah, oh, this is the beginning of the end of a mad period. We're mm. beginning the long trek back to normality, pre-2008 normality. What you're saying to me, and you, you know, you've forgotten more about financial markets these days than I'll ever know, but what you're saying is that there are investors in the markets who are thinking, actually, if we're raising rates and the Bank of England's raising rates, it might mean that they really believe the economy is in a better place. It's stronger. So it's a psychological uh, uh, switch for, for, for all of us, really. Yeah, I mean, the... the we, we've gone through perhaps one of the biggest shocks that any stock market could experience. I mean, obviously, we had the, had the Great Great Depression in the 30s, but, but this, the, the pandemic, uh, no one could have forecast that, and the impact was significant. And what we saw was the government step in and bail the economy out, bail out uh, vulnerable sectors and, and bail out the uh, uh, taxpayers. It, it is those taxpayers who will eventually pay the, um, pay the bill um, but, but yeah, it's the, the markets and, and, and many companies, although they were hit severely uh, in the immediate aftermath, have, have recovered very strongly. And now we're seeing some of the major indices uh, in the UK, which was had lagged international peers. The uh, domestic indices are now back to uh, roughly where they were um, pre the pandemic. So um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's forecasting inter interest rates back up at. 6%, 7%, that, that sort of figure. And no one anticipates, a, uh, as I said earlier, prolonged interest rate hike cycle. Um, you know, perhaps, perhaps two or three, uh, um, no more than that, and perhaps then a, a pause and, uh, and, and see, uh, see where we are. The economy does remain vulnerable, though, to, uh, to the, uh, um, you know, the pandemic and, and various um, variants, which, uh, which is yet unknown, which, which could, um, 
could derail the, um, the recovery. Very interesting. Thanks a lot, Lee Wilde, Head of Equity Strategy at the Interactive Investor. Nice Christmas tree, too. Look forward <laughs> to hearing, seeing you back on the show sometime. Vicky and Jasmine, you're going to stay with us. We're coming back later in the show. We're going to carry on this important discussion about interest rates, delving into the, how the change will affect savings, mortgages, and we'll be joined by a mortgage broker, too, later here on The Money. Your emails are flooding in on interest rates. Of course, it's a hugely important topic. We'll be reading out some of those messages after the break. Stay with us. You're on the money. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and um, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland, so a bit damp and drizzly here. But otherwise, as I said, the vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight, under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally, where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. Generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge. And also, they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. 
Join us for the Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is the Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. You're on the money with me, Liam Halligan. Now, we all use one of these. Yes, we do. Our mobile phones. <laughs> we rely on them to stay connected. But did you know that phone masts have generated millions of pounds of much-needed income for countless charities and community groups over recent years? Phone companies pay rent to various sports clubs, village halls, leisure centres across the country in return for being allowed to cite some of their phone masks that keep the networks running. But a new change in the law means mobile phone companies are now permitted to cut that rent by almost 90% in order, we're told, to speed up the rollout of 5G connectivity, meaning that the community groups that have come to rely on that rental income have been short-changed. Well, our South East reporter Ellie Costello joins us now to explain what that means. Ellie, why would phone companies want to do this? Hi, Liam. Yes, well, this is all about 5G connectivity, which I'm sure lots of us will agree. It's very important that we have 5G across the country. We've probably all been on a very dodgy uh, Zoom call with dodgy connection in the last few months, and we all can appreciate how important it is to have 5G. So this piece of legislation basically allows phone companies to determine how much rent they're going to pay to the landowners which their phone masts are sited on. And the idea is if they pay less rent, then they've got more money to put up more masts and therefore uh, that rollout of 5G happens quicker. That's the idea in theory. But the location of most of those phone masts are on community grounds. It's generally in a, in a place where somebody has lots of land and could benefit from those thousands of pounds worth in rent. So we do find it, it in churches and sporting grounds and community areas, sometimes even on NHS hospitals. This is obviously having a detrimental impact on those sorts of groups that relied on that rent from these phone masts, these phone companies. Well, I spoke to um, a business that this is affecting in Essex. This is Willowsbrook Social Club Sports Centre and it's also home to Billericay Rugby Club. And I spoke to the chairman there. Uh, he actually offered to have the phone mast erected there 24 years ago because they were offering him £8,000 a year. That's a fantastic thing for a sports club and it goes a long way to pay their bills. But obviously now, with a 90% cut, they're now looking more like £750 a year and it's having a detrimental effect on the the club. So let's have a little listen to what he told me. Eventually they're paying about £8,240 uh, each year. Uh, the new deal um, would see them pay £750 to us for each year. So we have a huge gas bill from obviously showers with two rugby teams playing here every, every week. Um, we have uh, costs for floodlights, um, uh, costs, you know, all, all sorts of different costs that we need, that we need, to, that we need to factor in. Um, and without the money, you know, essentially, we're going to need to go out to parents to try and pay some more money, go out to the club members to try and pay some more money. And it, it's going to affect doing projects like, such as the, 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 the cabin, which we have over here, which is one project. The, uh, the floodlights need to be redone. The pitches need lots of work and stuff. And it's going to affect, you know, the, the, um, what, what we can actually essentially do at the club. So just, just please think about, you know, the, all the, the work that goes in the volunteers um, and the little people. You know, we're, we're all using your mobile phones and we need the network, but, you know, we also need, need this money to, to run, sort of run this, this local club. 
So, Ellie, the UK is rolling out its 5G network. We're actually quite a long way behind many other so-called advanced countries. The government doesn't want to pay too much for that. The phone companies certainly don't want to pay. So they're making small community groups and charities pay, it seems to me. I mean, how widespread is this, certainly in your patch of uh, the east of England? Well, Liam, you're completely right. That's certainly how these community groups feel. They feel like this is a David and Goliath battle, and it's very much them up against the big guys. And it is widespread across the country. There are hundreds and thousands of phone masks up and down the country. So you can imagine the number of community groups that this is affecting that once had sometimes up to £10,000 a year coming in through rent, now looking more like £100. It can be really, really difficult for some of these groups. And unfortunately, a lot of them are going to fold and when I was speaking to Neil Jarvis who you just heard from there he said that he was concerned uh, about the club folding their Billericay Rugby Club but it's obviously going to have to be a lot of bacon baps and, and teas and coffees being sold on the side of those rugby games in order to, to match the rent that was coming through from phone masks so it is really really difficult and they certainly say it's going to be a big challenge for them uh, to keep that income up I have got two rights of reply to share with you Liam I have spoken to EE. They are the owners of that phone master at Billericay Rugby Club and they have sent me this statement. It says EE needs good relationship with landlords as we share a common interest of delivering modern communications that support them and the communities in which they are based. But we must balance individual site negotiations with the national need to invest in connecting more people especially in remote areas. So that was a statement from EE. And I also spoke to the Speed Up Britain campaign, which is supporting the rollout of 5G in this country. They sent me this statement. They said digital connectivity is vital for millions across the country, which is why the government reformed the code to strike a balance between the revenue earned by individual landowners and enabling digital networks to be more cost effective. Before 2017, site rents were unsustainable. Now the pricing structure is more aligned. Well, campaigners say that their concern is that they don't know exactly where this money is going. So if that rent uh, goes down for the phone companies, they can't be sure that it is actually being pumped back into the 5G network and the rollout of that. And another point to make, Liam, is the incentive for the future. What what kind of campaign groups and what kind of charities are going to accept a phone mast on their land if they're not having that thousands of pounds worth of rent which they had before? There's so much uh, work that goes on behind uh, repair work uh, with these phone masts and they would perhaps argue that hundreds of pounds wouldn't be worth it for them. But speaking to Neil and speaking to the Billericay Rugby Club, they say they just want fair rent, a fair price for ordinary people that this is affecting. A David and Goliath battle, as you say there. Thank you, Ellie Costello, our southeast of England reporter there, on the falling rents that charity groups and other community sports clubs are getting from the mobile phone giants. Now, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport have told GB News that our priority is ending patchy mobile coverage in rural areas and giving people and businesses the connectivity they need. Our new laws will encourage faster and more collaborative negotiations between landowners and network operators, ensuring fair prices are agreed for the right to install equipment. We can now go to the latest GB News headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Thanks very much, Liam. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to the rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those who can enter will also have to self-isolate for seven days, but isolation will be lifted after 48 hours if their test is negative. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.25% from 0.1%. Eight out of the nine committee members voted in favour of the move. Rates had been cut to a record low of 0.1% in March last year at the start of the pandemic. 
A man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa, but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Koshi Selamaj killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The chief medical officer has warned people to deprioritise certain social events ahead of Christmas to help prevent against the spread of coronavirus. Professor Chris Whitty warned that multiple records will be broken over the coming weeks as the Omicron variant surges in the UK. On Wednesday, daily Covid cases hit over 78,000, the highest since the pandemic began. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many people's Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. Well, those are the headlines. I'll have more on all of today's main stories at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge. And also, they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. You're on The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Today, it is all about interest rates after the Bank of England decided this lunchtime to raise rates for the first time in more than three years. They went up from 0.1% to 0.25%. This comes after inflation in the UK soared to a 10-year high of 5.1% in November. We had that news only yesterday. Just wanted to bring in a few of your emails. Many of you have been contacting us on this important topic. John says... The, real, the reason interest rates rose so much in the 80s is because, like our politicians, they held down rates for years. By keeping rates low, the bubble will burst, and boy, does it hurt if you have a mortgage. Many of my friends lost their homes. Some of my friends, too. Jake says, too little, too late. The interest rate should have gone up to 0.5%, then over the next year to at least... 2.5%. I suspect Jake has got some money in a savings account, but I'm not making any inferences. Mike says inflation will continue to rise in 2022, probably over 8%. The Bank of England rise to 0.25% is nothing. They will have to move to 2% soon, says Mike. Still all-time lows, but many in their 20s and 30s are used to borrowing low borrowing rates and many may struggle. Thanks for all your emails, some very interesting views here. And talking of interesting views, we still have in the studio Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economic and Business Research, friend of the show, and another friend of the show, Jasmine Bertels of MoneyMagpie.com. We're also joined now by Richard Lane, Director of External Affairs Hi, at the Debt at Charity, Step Change, and by Nick Mendes, Mortgage Technical Manager at John Charcoal. Let's go to you first, Nick, if I may. Jasmine Bertels was saying earlier on, 
when interest rates go down, mortgage companies don't always move quickly. Banks certainly move quickly to lower savings rates. When interest rates go up, it's the other way round. The banks don't move quickly, but the mortgage companies do. What's been the response to what is a surprise increase in interest rates, according to lots of people in the market? Absolutely. I think the, that's from what we've seen anyway, if we take into account what happened last month anyway, we saw a lot of the banks start to increase rates, preempting a rate rise. This time around is completely different. No lender has actually increased rates. They're still virtually the same as it was to last week. And it'll be interesting to see what actually happens this afternoon. Will lenders follow suit? Who knows? But at the moment, no lender actually increased rates in preparation, which was, I think, it caught everyone off guard. No one expected this to happen. Um, I think, we've, which we already alluded to, in terms of rate rises, I think there's going to be an impact come spring, maybe 0.5 and closer to 1%, which Bank of England mentioned in the report last month. But at the moment, no rates has, has, has actually increased. Very interesting. Richard, let's go to you. Uh, Step Change is an important debt charity. I'm thinking today not just about um, interest rates going up for savers, and obviously we have many savers watching uh, on the money today, but I'm also thinking of people who are in debt, particularly people who are in debt at the more vulnerable end of the income spectrum. To what extent do you think a rise in interest rates, and I think everyone th feels that this is the first in an, a series of interest rate rises that's going to happen over the months and years to come. How do they impact people who get in contact with step change? I mean, of course, there's never a perfect time to raise interest rates, is there? But we know from our clients that they are expecting now a bit of a double whammy as we head into winter and head towards Christmas, because firstly, they're seeing an enormous rise in their utility bills, in their energy bills, in the price of food. And now they're going to be seeing potentially the cost of their borrowing start to go up. In terms of clients who come to us, actually, overwhelmingly, they rent their own homes, so they're not going to be worried about their mortgage. Uh, and they're also having to turn to high cost credit already, where they're already seeing huge interest rates on the borrowing that they have. So this is only going to potentially compound that problem for many households. This is definitely a problem, isn't it, Jasmine? As interest rates go up, it's a tiny interest rate rise, but it is the change in the cycle. There will be more rises to come. Mainstream lending prices go up. Mainstream lenders perhaps become a bit more picky. More people are pushed mm -hmm. into the arms of so-called twilight lending industry, yeah. doorstep lending industry, mm -hmm. legal, some of it semi-legal. Mm -hmm. That's when the vulnerable really get hit, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's vulnerable and it's also the middle because uh, about 2.2 million people are on mortgages that track the, the base rate. So that's the number of people are going to have, find their in their costs increase. But yes, it's, it is, again, it is the vulnerable. It's those who have to drive a car, who are already seeing their prices going up, heating, eating. It's the basics of life. Those are the, the things that are going up. So they need to be brought down. But at the same time, as you say, um, if, if that affects um, borrowing pri prices, then that's going to be a, a pincer movement, really, to those who are, are already in a state. Vicky, how high do you think interest rates could go? I know it's a really tough question, but many people are thinking about it and people like us have to at least have a stab at... Well, I mean, the, the truth is, of course, that it's a global issue. Yep. Uh, it's electricity prices, gas prices going up generally, staff shortages, which everyone has been experiencing, supply chain issues. So it's not, you know, just the UK. We've spent too much money trying to help the economy issue. It is that everyone's done that. So a lot will depend on what happens with... with Omicron, the variant, whether indeed we're going to be seeing a slowdown in particular yeah, yeah. sectors such as travel and so on, whether demand there. And that would mean we wouldn't yeah. have more interest rate rises well, soon if Omicron really hammers the economy. We may not have as high inflation as been has been forecast. That's right. And therefore, we may not need to raise interest rates anything like right. as much. But it is worth bearing in mind that throughout the whole of the period after the financial crisis, when of course we had our ups and downs, and also inflation did go up. Interest 2010, rates were, 11, 12, yes, yeah. To 2019, yeah. the highest interest rates got to was 0.75% yeah. in the UK. Yeah. So in, in order... But that was what quantitative easing was going throughout that whole period, right? Of Which course. keeps interest rates artificially low. Well, we're still having that, of course, going on. Not, not perhaps from here on as high as before, but it's quite interesting because if you look at what the European Central Bank has just announced, yeah. 
which is a little bit like what the, 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 the Federal Reserve in the US has announced, is that they're reducing the quantitative easing quite significantly. They will have stopped buying more bonds in the market themselves, in the secondary market, by March, yeah. whereas originally was going to be. That is under their pandemic purchase scheme. There is also an old one that they will carry on doing, possibly even increase it a bit. But what they're saying is we're still going to reinvest all the money that we get mm. from uh, basically, you know, uh, anything that matures that we own on our balance sheet, if you like. Yeah. We will reinvest it and buy more, more bonds anyway. So the support will still be there to keep long-term rates low. So, so yes, of course, we worry about mortgages. But what you might find is that the underlying interest rate for mortgages may not be going up very much mm. at all. Just to unpack what you said, because we really are now at the limit of the sort of technical discussion that you find on television, right? And I'm proud of that. That's what On The Money is about. And it's great that we're venturing into these more technical waters. But let's take the viewers with us. What you're essentially saying, Vicky Price, is that as long as quantitative easing is around and there's the idea there could be a bit more of it, Indeed. then interest rates are likely not to go back to 4 5%, 10% where they were in our younger days when we bought our first homes, right? You're saying that they're going to stay, you know, 1%, 2%, only if quantitative easing stays on the scene. Yes, and in fact, the ECB has said today, the European yeah. Central Bank, that if necessary, they will do more. And that's the interesting thing, that although for the moment they think they need to draw back a little bit, yeah. they will continue to be involved in the market and intervene in the market, and they may, in fact, increase those purchases too, if necessary. The danger is, though, with quantitative easing, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a bit like, you know, sweets. Mm. They're all right in moderation, but if countries keep going, mm. ever printing more money, expanding the money supply, there will be inflation, currencies will collapse, mm. you will get financial chaos. But just go back to... Um, the pounds and pence in people's pockets, if you like. Let's go back to you, Nick Mendes. Jasmine Bertels there said about 2.2 million households are on variable mortgages in this country. There are about 27, 000, uh, 27 million UK households, so it's less than one in ten. It strikes me that there are far fewer people with mortgages uh, than there were 10, 15 years ago. More households now are in homes that are owned outright they're often much older people. Younger people are finding it difficult to buy homes, of course. But because there are fewer mortgage holders in the UK these days and fewer of them are on variable rates than they used to be, the Bank of England's ability to control spending through the mortgage market is now much less than it used to be. Absolutely. I think when, when we take into account habits as well, most people, if you look back over the last few years, more and more people are taking out fixed rates for stability. Yeah. So when you have interest rate rises, we don't see the same effect that it does in pounds or pence of what you see on a daily, but, you know, coming out on the mortgage payment each month. And we, when we take into account, as an example, the rate increase, what, what it actually means in pounds or pence for clients is that a typical tracker monthly repayment will, in fact, go up around by £10 a month. And a variable, if you're on your standard variable rate, this rate increase will typically increase your monthly repayments by £10. So you're not going to see a huge um huge change, so to speak, when it comes to the outgoings. But what we are seeing is it's about trends and habits. And what is interesting is with the, when lenders are taking into account further borrowing, we're starting to see long-term fixed rates. And in a way, and it'll be interesting the demands that clients have to really counteract potential rate rises. I think everyone's focused on, is this the start and how high will it go over the next, over the course of the mortgage lifespan? That's exactly the money that on the money's po that's exactly the question that on the money's posing today. How high can they go? And I guess what you're saying there is that because there's a sense now that rates are going up and will keep going up, albeit quite slowly, given what Vicky Price said about quantitative easing, there will be a move now to long term fixes that the mortgage industry hopefully there'll be a bit of competition between those providers so the long term fixes remain good value but interest rates are going up richard lane uh, your charity step change does help people who get into financial difficulties as interest rates go up just tell us what's happened during the pandemic in terms of vulnerable households becoming indebted and getting into financial difficulties I mean, I think the first thing that's really important for us to point out is that this isn't a new problem. Actually, we've been seeing these trends for a decade where we're seeing uh, overwhelmingly our clients are under the age of 40. They don't own their own home. They don't have any financial security in terms of savings to fall back on. And we've just seen some of those trends accelerate over the pandemic. 
So in terms of what we see, it's people who are in unstable gig economy jobs who may not have been furloughed. They don't own their own home, so they can't access things like uh, mortgage payment holidays. And they are acutely financially vulnerable because they do have these unstable uh, incomes that means that they can't build up uh, a safety net. And throughout the pandemic, they've had to turn to borrowing, uh, often payday loans or very high cost uh, terms of borrowing just to be able to make ends meet. And now they're facing potentially a perfect storm with some of that support that has kept them afloat, things like the £20 uplift on universal credit, start to come to an end at exactly the same time, where they're seeing their household bills rise quite drastically uh, and interest rates rise, which are going to be able to put, it's going to start to push up uh, some of the borrowing that they might have. You know, overwhelmingly, the most common type of credit that our clients have is credit cards and store cards. How is that going to translate into those costs as people head into winter and they rely on that type of credit uh, to make ends meet uh, and put food on the table and heat their homes? Very interesting. Very Jasmine, interesting. open-ended Jasmine. question to you. We're coming to the end of our uh, discussion mm. now. How high do you think interest rates might go? You've heard from Vicky. It really does depend. The big question, the elephant in the room, is quantitative yes. easing. It's exactly. hard to even say, let alone get your head around, <laughs> as we've discussed <laughs> yes. many times. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? What are you going to be telling people who subscribe to moneymagpie.com? Well, I, I, I agree with, um, with Vicky that I think interest rates will be kept down. I think quantitative easing will continue. And that means that we will. I agree with Mike, who wrote in. I think we will get to 8% at least. Inflation. In, inflation. You do. Yeah. Inflation is the thing that I'm focusing on because I think that that's, you know, we, we the people, are going to pay the price um, for the government's machinations, frankly, not just our government um, and, of course, not just our bank, central bank. Um, they are just printing money like there's no tomorrow and we're the ones, I think, who are going to pay for it. Vicky, with all your experience as, a, as an econo economist in, in government, academia and so on, just paint a picture because quite a lot of our viewers are younger people. They won't remember the 70s and the 80s like you and I do. Sorry to be unchivalrous about that, but I was, in, I was there too. Uh, just tell us what happens when inflation gets to sort of 8, 9, 10%. What happens when there's a sense that the authorities, be it the Bank of England, the government, have stopped worrying about inflation or are more concerned about just spend, 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 rather than reining in price pressures? What happens? A lot of the confidence goes. There is no doubt about that. But, of course, if uh, people think that inflation is here to stay, they're going to be asking for a lot higher wages, yeah. and then it becomes ingrained to the system. Mm -hmm. And it then takes a lot of effort to get it out of the system. So, in other words, a lot of austerity may need to follow... To or... push out those inflation expectations, exactly. as we say. But I'm not... I mean, we're getting a little bit there because we've already seen demands for wages which are much higher than yeah. they've been for quite some time. Industrial we... action. Mm -hmm. Look at Tesco. Look I mean, at some of the public sector unions. I agree, but do remember that wages had fallen in yep, the previous that's year. that's true. And that if you're looking at where we are now... In terms of real wages, of course, but even if you look at the nominal wage increase that have taken place, we're only just going back to pre-pandemic levels. That's true. And also, we should say, shouldn't we, Jasmine, that um, back in the 70s, uh, you know, almost 50 percent of the British workforce were in a trade union. They were very good at yeah. pushing through yeah. ever rising wages. Mm -hmm. Now it's less than 25 percent largely in the public sector rather than the private sector. Yes, I mean, as, as Step Change has pointed out, the gig economy. And, ooh, again, we have a sort of a two-speed economy. You've got, uh, and we've seen this particularly over the last couple of years, the rich have got richer, much, much richer. The poor have got poorer. Um, and so if you are in a gig economy um, job, certainly if you're working in, in hospitality or something like that, now is a very, very tough time. Mm. But a lot of people, you know, just in the next couple of weeks, they'll be staying at home, they'll be saving money. Indeed. Thank you to all our guests today. What a fantastic discussion. You heard from Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economic and Business Research, Jasmine Bertles, founder of moneymagpie.com. Thanks also to Richard Lane for joining me. He's the Director of External Affairs at the debt charity Step Change and Nick Mendes, Mortgage Technical Manager at the Mortgage Brokers John Charco. I just wanted to bring in some more of your emails. We've had so many on this subject. Don't let anyone tell you that the general public isn't interested in business 
and economics. They absolutely are. Emails flooding in. A lot of you feel really passionate about this. Rebecca says, hopefully a rise in interest rates will take the heat off the housing market. Good point, which we didn't yeah. discuss. Very good point. After years of saving a deposit, potential buyers are left with dismal interest on savings, while the price of the properties they're chasing has skyrocketed. The only thing that can bring them back down is interest rate rises. Chris says, if you've taken out a mortgage on the assumption of a 0.1% base rate in perpetuity and a 15 basis point point rise is going to cause you hardship, then you only have yourself to blame. Tough love. Tony says, it's Bidenflation, referring, I guess, to the US president. Too many printed dollars and not enough sale for good, uh, not enough goods for sale creates inflation. It's simple. We've got a lot of printed pounds as well, I must say, not just dollars. And David puts it simply, it's too little too late. Rates need to rise again next yeah. month. A punishment beating, says Dave. You've been watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Thanks to all my guests. Thanks to you for joining me today. We'll be back for more economics, business and consumer news at 1pm tomorrow with our special two-hour bumper edition. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and that was On The Money. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and uh, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland, so a bit damp and drizzly here. But otherwise, as I said, the vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight, under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally, where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. Generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi, I'm Alistair Stewart, and I really hope that you can join me here on GB News. I've been in this game for 40 years, and I've made lots of friends, but I try and reflect what they think about the big stories of the day in conversation with me. That's why we call it Alistair Stewart and Friends, and you're a key part of it as well. I always get inundated with emails and messages and texts, and if they're really good, I play them back to you. 12 till 3, every Saturday and Sunday. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good afternoon. It's time to discuss the big issues of the day with me, Gloria De Piero, Liam Halligan, experts and normal people like you and me. And me. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're asking when it comes to COVID restrictions. Do you trust the medics or the ministers? And what will you be doing for Christmas? But first, it's the GB News headlines with Tams and Roberts. Liv, thank you. Here are the top stories at two o'clock. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to the rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those who can enter will also have to self-isolate for seven days, but isolation will be lifted after 48 hours if their test is negative. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.25% from 0.1%. Eight out of the nine committee members voted in favour of the move. Rates had been cut to a record low of 0.1% in March last year at the start of the pandemic. The chief medical officer has warned people to deprioritise certain social events ahead of Christmas to help prevent against the spread of coronavirus. On Wednesday, daily COVID cases hit over 78,000, the highest since the pandemic began. Professor Chris Whitty warned that multiple records will be broken over the coming weeks as the Omicron variant surges in the UK. Anybody who has something that really matters to them, concentrate on that thing and then build out from there, rather than just accepting every invitation and going to every bit of work uh, in person. Clinical studies are showing that lots of people are getting reinfected uh, with Omicron who previously had been vaccinated or had a combination of vaccines and natural infection. So it definitely is likely to bypass some of the ability to reduce, in, uh, reduce infection. Chancellor Rishi Sunak is to hold talks with representatives of the hospitality sector who are calling for further government support after the emergence of the Omicron variant. Some in the industry are predicting significant falls in footfall in December as COVID cases rise. Business groups are calling for an extension of the VAT reduction, which is due to end in March, and for business rates to be deferred. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many people's Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. A man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Kochi Selamaj killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The prosecution alleged he travelled to London from his home in Eastbourne to carry out a premeditated and predatory attack. He'll face a further hearing in February. Two people are missing after a block of flats was gutted by fire in a suspected arson attack. After an extensive search, Thames Valley Police say it doesn't expect there to be any more survivors. One person has been confirmed dead after the blaze. A 31-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. At least four children have died and more are badly injured in Australia after strong winds lifted a bouncy castle during end-of-year school celebrations. Two boys and two girls in their final year of primary school died in Tasmania after the children's ride flew away, causing them to fall 10 metres. Five more children are in hospital, including one in a serious condition. 
young children on a, a fun day out together with their families and it turns to such horrific tragedy. At this time of year, it just breaks your heart. UK authorities are responding to several incidents involving small boats in the English Channel. Border force and lifeboats have already intercepted several inflatables and landed more than 100 people in Dover this morning. Our home and security editor Mark White witnessed the latest arrival of migrants at Dover Harbour. This is another day of significant migrant activity uh, in the Channel and that, the reason for that is that conditions are very calm out in the channel at the moment. We've had about 10 days of pretty atrocious weather where no small boats have been able to make it across. But now that weather conditions have improved, there's a window of about two or three days, we're expecting a lot of migrant activity. Mark White reporting there. Well, those are the top stories. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now back to Gloria and Liam. Coming up on De Piero and Halligan today. We'll be discussing the latest advice on coronavirus. Who do you trust, the medics or the politicians? Have you cancelled your Christmas plans? What will you be doing? Today, we want to know what you think. It's a tough time for the country. Lots of different opinions out there. Join the discussion with your views. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Are you concerned about Christmas with the rapid spread of Omicron? Who can you see? What should you be doing? Who should you be seeing? Are you've got a dilemma on your hands? Are you having to choose between Christmas dinner with your parents or perhaps a pre-Christmas party with your friends? England's Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty has said that we should scale back our Christmas plans after warning that Omicron is going to be a problem. Earlier today, he told a select committee of MPs further COVID restrictions may be needed if vaccines are less effective than expected. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister said this morning that he didn't want to make choices for us about our social life, but we should be cautious and think about our activities. So is Omicron making you rethink your festive plans? Who do you trust, the politicians or the scientists? Anybody who has something that really matters to them, concentrate on that thing and then build out from there, rather than just accepting every invitation and going to every bit of work uh, in person. Clinical studies are showing that lots of people are getting reinfected uh, with Omicron who previously had been vaccinated or had a combination of vaccines and natural infection. So it definitely is likely to bypass some of the ability to reduce, in, uh, reduce infection. Chris Whitty there, the Chief Medical Officer, speaking earlier today. Well, it seems the Queen has decided to be cautious, and this morning she revealed that she'd cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch. And this came as Chris Whitty was giving that evidence to the Health and Social Care Committee of the House of Commons. Joining us in the studio now is our GB News political editor, Darren McCamfrey. A week to Christmas, all terribly festive and cheerful, isn't it? <laughs> um, quite gloomy, really. Uh, who do you listen to? The science of the government? Now, the argument the government's making this morning or this afternoon is that they're both on the same page to a degree, that they're both urging caution. Uh, has Chris Whitty gone further than the Prime Minister? He has, with this idea that you should kind of prioritise the key events that you think, particularly in the run-up to Christmas. He's saying that for two reasons, I think. A, because... Obviously, he wants to slow down the spread of this Omicron variant. Uh, but also, we know that hundreds of thousands of people now get infected every day. If you get infected today, you have to isolate for 10 days. That means you miss Christmas. So if you want to go home for Christmas or you want to go round to your parents or whatever you want to do on Christmas Day, his suggestion is, well, have a think about potentially where the risks might be in the run-up to Christmas. At the same time... Uh, the government are saying not to cancel anything, to kind of carry on as normal. So there is a very distinct divide here, even though the Prime Minister is uh, urging caution. And for... And this is a massive knock-on effect, because this is what MPs are really angry about this morning, particularly Conservative MPs, is that that means that loads of businesses, hospitality businesses like restaurants and bars, are caught in the middle, caught between, essentially, a very cautious public now who are cancelling parties and dinners and lunches and drinks 
at the rate of knots, but they're getting no compensation from the government because it's not official advice that, of course, that people should stay away. And so they are complaining that at what should be the busiest time of the year, the most lucrative time of the year for them, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of all at sea. Some are calling it lockdown by stealth, Darren, a phrase that I imagine will become quite widely used in the days to come. Because as Nicola Sturgeon said when she spoke to MSPs in Holyrood, you know, no one's cancelling your Christmas. That was her direct quote. But it seems that advice from ministers, indeed the example of our monarch, is that, but you might want to think about reining your Christmas in. Yeah, well, it's very much like kind of leading up to March of last year, when even though, do you remember when the pubs were still open, but lots of people, days, even weeks ahead of that, mm. yeah. were already starting uh, to roll back in the socialising. You know, I was right in central London last night. It's pretty clear that's happening to a large degree yeah. already. Um, as you say, the Queen has cancelled at that lunch. But that still leaves hospitality in this, this awful, awful position. Now, Nicola Sturgeon, I think, in Scotland has offered 100 million quid. Hospitality industry there says it is not enough, but it's better than what's been offered in England. And all this, of course, while the Chancellor, <laughs> Rishi Sunak, is in California uh, on a work trip, I'll bet. The Treasury are very clear that he is in touch with the hospitality industry and with ministers back in London, but not exactly ideal timing yeah. that the Chancellor is out of uh, the country. There are loads of implications for all of this, though, leading up to Christmas, aside from the concerns. And we're going to get big numbers this afternoon, two big numbers. We're going to get probably a record number of boosters again, which is uh, good, good news for those that want to get boosted with a third shot. Uh, though, as Chris Whitty says, you know, the, the evidence about the impact of even a third vaccine is not known yet, but the assumption is it'll be better than uh, simply having two. Uh, but we're also going to get big, big numbers with infection rates. Uh, I mean, we could see double figures. I mean, it's going to be staggering, the number of infections. Anecdotally, I'm sure this is true across the country, but it's particularly high in London. You know, it, it's difficult not to know someone now who's not been infected in the last couple of days or weeks. What does that mean, though? Those people have to isolate. It means that if you are a worker in a train station or in a restaurant, a hospital, a police officer, you know, we're going to potentially see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people taken out of the workforce mm. over the coming weeks. That is mm. going to put enormous... The pandemic will come back. Yeah, yeah. Not, well, the, there's not even the pandemic. It's yeah. not people getting pinned. It's people literally getting the virus. Mm. And that's serious implications for our public services, but also for just being able to move around. The logistics of the country will come under pressure. And just one other little bit of information that was raised during that select committee uh, meeting about the issue of pregnant women. Mm. Uh, because we know there's a little bit of confusion, wasn't there, when the vaccine rollout first began about whether pregnant women should get the vaccine or not. Uh, it was then made very clear that they should, that it is very safe. But it's clear that actually lots of pregnant women didn't do that. Only 22% uh, of pregnant women have been given or have had the jab. Wow. And yet of those expectant mothers who ended up or have ended up in hospital... 96% are unvaccinated. Mm. So the government are going to prioritise pregnant women now for COVID jabs. They're going to launch an education campaign uh, to try and ensure uh, that does uh, happen. So it's really tricky stuff. It's difficult. Of course, this is kind of times when we don't know. It's all about case numbers at the moment. We don't know the implication on yeah. hospitalisations. You know, there is still, and Chris Whitty, you know, this is a cautious approach by the government. He's arguing, you know, there might be, it might not be as bad as, as they fear, but he says all the evidence they've got does not point in a good direction. Mm. Dan McCaffrey, GB News, Thank Blitz Letter. Fantastic summary of some really tough news. Thank you very much. Joining us now on the show is viro virologist Dr Chris Smith. Chris, uh, it's lovely to see you and, and welcome to, to the show. Can I just ask you personally, have you reined in your pre-Christmas socialising in light of what the, uh, Chris Whitty has said um, yesterday. Yesterday, it was yesterday's press conference, wasn't it? Yes. Quite frankly, Gloria, I'm so disorganised this year. I haven't organised any uh, socialising to unorganise. So perhaps going forward, I'll, I'll consider my social calendar. But uh, no, I haven't had to change anything because I've been so busy as well. And, and Christmas is, gonna, is, is catching me unawares, I can tell you. I, I've never been this close to Christmas and this unprepared or ill-prepared either. But no, I haven't changed my social calendar, but I can see why some people might. I'm a man after your own heart, Chris. I'm totally disorganised ahead of Christmas. I haven't done any Christmas shopping yet. I feel better now. As, as, as ever. On a serious note, to what extent do you think 
um, uh, viewers would would be justified in being a little bit confused at the moment, given the signals from ministers that, of course, there's not going to be another lockdown and, of course, you shouldn't cancel your Christmas, and then advice from some of the most prominent scientists in the land that maybe you should. Well, I think what they're doing is, is looking at the numbers. And what we have from, say, South Africa is a, a strong steer as to the likely direction of the trajectory and indeed, that is being mirrored here, albeit with a lag, because obviously they saw this in South Africa first. And what they saw was a really big, very fast acceleration in the rate of transmission and effectively displacement of what had been their dominant circulating strain, the Delta agent, by this new Omicron variant. Now, what we're seeing is a similar uptick at really quite rapid pace, where we've gone from just a handful of cases uh, a couple of weeks ago and single numbers of percent of the diagnoses we were making to now a coin toss. One in two of the diagnoses in some parts of the country are this new variant. So it, it is spreading very fast. Now, although the data from South Africa show us that it does appear this is a very mild infection, when you catch this, it is a lot less severe for the average person who catches it than Delta. There are still going to be in that number some people who will get more severe infection. So if you take something which is spreading at the rate this is, it is infecting not just vulnerable people who are unvaccinated, but it's infecting people who have been vaccinated and would have regarded themselves previously as pretty well protected. And it's hitting people who've been infected and therefore have natural immunity. So basically, it's got the entire gamut of the population to play with. So the acceleration can be really very dramatic. And what the politicians are doing is saying, well, well look, uh, with that number of cases, even if a tiny fraction turn into consequences, because of the steepness at which this is growing, it will all happen all at the same time. And that really could compromise our ability to run the country, as well as, with a focus on the NHS, deliver good health care for those people, albeit that they may well be much less ill than if they'd caught Delta, for example. So it's really not so much the virus as the rate at which this is happening that's got people concerned. And by enacting what they're doing, which is to encourage reinforcement of vaccination because that's our best weapon against this thing. That will help to protect individuals. But the second thing it will do is help to slow the trajectory a bit. Because if you do protect people 75% of the time, which is what being double jabbed and vaccinated with a booster does do, you will put in the way a sort of moderating influence. You'll retard the spread a bit of the virus. And in that way, through those two, those two sort of approaches, you'll help to reduce the pressure on the health service. So that's their aim, but they're still nevertheless concerned about the overall numbers that we might end up trying to handle all at once. Um, Chris Whitty said, the signs are not good, but we need more data. He also referred yeah, this yeah. morning to having to be sure about how effective our vaccines are against the new variant. How long do we have to wait until we get some certainty? When do we get this data? Uh, it's going to fall into sort of several categories. There's direct observational data, which we're getting from a range of countries, where we can look at who's catching this, how ill they become, whether or not they're vaccinated, past infected or unvaccinated, and that gives us some directional steer. There's direct observation from our own country, where people get infected and we follow them up. But people don't catch the infection and then immediately toddle off to hospital or worse, off to the mortuary there's often a progression and it takes two or three weeks from the time that a person catches the infection to the stage where they're seriously unwell enough that they register in our statistics and end up in a hospital bed. So it's going to take a few weeks yet before really we see the impact of what we're doing today begin to manifest. But if we wait until then, it may be too late to do anything about it. The other thing that is going on in the background is that scientists have got samples of this variant. They're growing that in the laboratory and they're doing tests where they'll take the antibodies that people have made in response to two doses of vaccine, two doses plus a booster, natural immunity, and they will add those antibodies to the virus in the test tube. And they'll ask the simple question, are these antibodies capable of stopping this virus growing? And if they are, how many of them do I need? And once you've got that number, you can then say, oh, what's the level of antibody that the average person in society has once they've been boosted? 
And once you know that, you have some degree of certainty about how likely the sorts of interventions they're putting in place are going to be. And so you can bring all that data together probably early in January and we'll have a much clearer idea. But of course, in the meantime, there's a big festival season, there's a holiday, there's lots of people who actually really want a break and a holiday, and that is going to accelerate the, the spread. And it may have very few consequences. On the other hand, it, it could have quite serious consequences in terms of severe disease, and, and that's what the politicians are eager to avoid. So, Dr Smith, down to brass tacks, as it were, if you were the chief medical officer, I'm sure it's only a matter of time, um, joking aside, if you had the Prime Minister's ear, what would you be telling him, the Cabinet, the government, the opposition, that we should be doing now? Would, do you think we're right, the kind of balance we've got at the moment, not quite going into lockdown, but warning the public that they should curtail their activities? Or would you want something more restrictive now? Well, reading between the lines, what they have done is to be completely open about the fact that we've got a problem looming on the horizon in terms of cases. But if, if I think that there wasn't the mitigating data from South Africa, I think we would already have shut the country. They haven't done that, and I think that's quite telling. And I think what, what is being urged on people is responsibility for our own actions and for society as a whole. And so I, I think actually they're trying to steer a middle ground without taking away and robbing people of too many freedoms, because I think there's respect for the fact that if we do that, we, we really do risk losing the crowd here. And we need the, the support of the public to, to enact the sorts of measures. So I think at the moment, a, a sort of middle ground approach is a reasonable one because it's not robbing us of too many freedoms. It's relatively easy to row back from, but it's easy to escalate if we need to. And I think we'll know within the next couple of weeks if we, if we need to go further. Dr. Chris Smith, thank you so much for joining us. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We've looked at what the politicians and the medics are saying, but today we want to hear from you, of course, RGB News viewers. Who do you trust, the ministers or the scientists? And have you changed, like the Queen, your pre-Christmas plans, your socialising plans? Indeed. Is the Omicron variant cramping you, your style, your family style, in the run-up to the festive period? We've started a poll on this question over on the GB News Twitter page. You can add your votes via at GB News. We'll be re reviewing the results later on in the programme and telling you the results of that poll. After the break, we'll be crossing live to Dover to catch up with GB News Home Affairs. Editor Mark White as UK authorities are responding to several incidents involving small boats in the channel. But just before that, here's your weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and um, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland, so a bit damp and drizzly here. But otherwise, as I said, the vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight, under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally, where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. Generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. 
Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. I'm Darren McCaffrey and join me on The Briefing Monday to Thursday at 3pm. You'll get your afternoon fix of all the latest political stories, debate and analysis, as well as interviews with some of the biggest names in UK politics. It's a problem that affects the whole world, Darren. From Westminster to Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast, if it's happening in UK politics, we've got it covered. That's The Briefing with me, Darren McCaffrey, Monday to Thursday, 3pm on GB News. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We'd love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is the Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Before the end of the show at three o'clock, we will be looking at your thoughts on, on whether you trust medics or ministers, whether you're changing your pre-Christmas plans, uh, socialising plans, just like the Queen has. Get in touch. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, UK authorities are responding to several incidents involving small boats in the English Channel. Border force and lifeboats have already intercepted several inflatables and landed more than 100 people in Dover this morning. Calmer weather in the Channel is likely to see more small boats attempt the crossing. Joining us now is GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White, who is in Dover. Mark. Well, good afternoon. We are uh, in well in excess of uh, 100 migrants who've been landed here now. It's uh, closer 
to 300 uh, and incidents still ongoing in the channel at the moment. I just want to show you actually uh, just behind me, this area had been cleared of small boats first thing this morning. There are half a dozen small boats there now. They have just been towed in to Dover in the last few hours. You can see actually they paint the numbers on the side just so they can keep track of them. I see 986, 987, uh, the black longer vessel uh, that's there. So 987 is the number of vessels that have been uh, seized, uh, intercepted in the channel by UK authorities, uh, marked up and brought into to Dover. Uh, so there's still another couple of small boats actually that uh, have been abandoned in the channel because these border force vessels can only take uh, a couple uh, on in tow at one time. So what tends to happen is they'll uh, leave one or two of them actually in the channel, maybe pick them up later, maybe they'll wash ashore and then get picked up. We're also told that there was some beach landings at Dungeness, just further down the coast, two boats that came ashore there, uh, and another boat that was towed in by the lifeboat. Uh, so again, just adding to the numbers, and once those numbers are calculated as well, and the other interceptions underway in the channel, we are going to be well in excess of 400. Uh, a little earlier on, the Border Force vessel Hurricane came in, as I was reporting live here from Dover Harbour. This is what I saw. There are a number of other ongoing incidents in the channel with other vessels being intercepted by border force who are out there in the channel in strength today and of course the lifeboats. So that uh, boat Hurricane, uh, the Border Force Catamaran, is now back out actually into the channel picking up more uh, migrants off small boats. In addition to that, uh, the bigger border force cutters, seeker uh, and searcher are both out there as well. Searcher was in here a little earlier, offloading uh, about 40 migrants uh, who were brought ashore here to the makeshift reception centre here at Dover Harbour. Thanks for that, Mark White, the GB News Home and Security Editor reporting from Dover. Right after this break, it's all about your thoughts. Do join the conversation next on De Pierre and Halligan. We want to know what your Christmas plans are, whether you've changed them because of Omicron. But first, it is time for the news. Good afternoon, I'm Tamsin Roberts. Here are the latest headlines. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to the rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those who can enter will also have to self-isolate for seven days, but isolation will be lifted after 48 hours if their test is negative. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.25% from 0.1%. Eight out of the nine committee members voted in favour of the move. Rates had been cut to a record low of 0.1% in March last year at the start of the pandemic. A man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa, but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Koshi Selamaj killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many attendees' Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. Well, that's all for now. I'll have a full update for you on today's main stories at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. 
My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. It's nine days till Christmas. What are your plans in the run-up to Christmas Day? Have they changed because of the spread of Omicron? Or have you decided to continue with your original socialising plans? We're going to be gauging whether people have indeed changed their plans or not with some of our regular guests. And we've been asking you, have you changed your Christmas plans because of the increasing cases of this new variant of the COVID virus? We're delighted to be joined by property manager... Jenny, love it. So, Jenny, tell us, have you had to cancel lots of Christmas parties or are you carrying on regardless? I haven't cancelled one thing. In fact, I'm wearing my Christmas dress today um, because I'm, I'm going to a party tomorrow. I'm going to a party on Sunday and I'm really looking forward to spending Christmas with my family um, uh, on Christmas, uh, unlike last year when it was cancelled. And my children are looking forward to seeing their cousins. They're so excited. So you got your dress on, you're, you're revved up and ready to go, <laughs> Jenny. So you haven't changed anything? Uh, not one thing, Liam. Have you been yeah. boosted? Um, you talked about a rise in cases. Um, but if you look at the positivity rate, that's essentially been flat for quite a long time. So I think um, uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, misinformation actually I think the government has been uh, ha has been launching a campaign of fear and uh, we need to look at what the evidence really is and and it doesn't look scary to me have you been boosted uh, not yet but you're still but I'm an, not an, worried an, because I'm, um, sorry. sorry I'm guessing you're you're Parents, are you, are you seeing your parents, and and they're, obviously they're they're older. They're, are you are you worried about socialising in the run up to Christmas and putting them at any risk? Well, my mother is eighty, and she lives in America, and um, so I have a bit of a unique perspective. In America, they haven't really changed um, how they're going about things very much. Their government never told them who they can kiss or who they can hug or who they can have in their house. So, um, you know, my mother had uh, people over for Christmas. She had four households over for New Year's last year. She's not worried. Um, she grew up in Germany after World War II. Her father died in a plane crash in the war. Her mother's leg was shot. Um, her, her, grand her grandparents starved or, or maybe froze to death after the war. And she knows what real risk is and, um, you know, Every day of living is a risk, and we can't just stop living for the prospect of one disease. So, so I guess what you're saying, your perspective, Jenny, is you've looked at the data, you can see that while case numbers are going up, the, the, positive, the, 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 the extent to which those, ca those uh, cases uh, are positive is a function of the fact that we're doing many, many more tests. You don't think that... Uh, Omicron is particularly dangerous, at least that's what the World Health Organization 
evidence is suggesting at this point, so you're going ahead. Yes, I mean, um, I think you've had it on your program. I've listened to what the director of the South African uh, Health um, uh, uh, Organization has said, and she has said very clearly that Omicron is mild disease for the majority. Um, she said whether you're a child, whether you're 80, whether you have underlying conditions, it's mild disease. And I think it sounds like what uh, what the government, our government is saying to us is, is we need to be precautionary and take these um, measures as a precautionary stance. But I think it's precautionary to um, to let people live their lives because um, uh, we can't just constantly curtail people's lives because this really affects uh, people's well-being and and life is about celebrations with your family and um, nativities at Christmas. I'm especially worried about the effect on children because um, childhood is a short season and our children's important rites of passage and, and life events have been um, have been curtailed and they don't get those opportunities back. Jenny Lovett, thanks a lot for joining us. That's Jenny Lovett, who is a property manager who's not changing her plans this Christmas. Joining us on the show is the CEO of the Nighttime Industries Association, Michael Kill. Michael, personal question. Have you reined it in a bit in light of um, Chris Whitty's <laughs> advice last night? Uh, have, I, have I, what, changed my plans? Is, yeah, have you reined them in um, at all ahead of Christmas Day? No, no, no. I, I'm, I, sadly, although I represent a... Uh, uh, an extra, an amazing industry. I, I've uh, got quite tame plans because I have children and and family, but nothing's been changed on our side. I mean, we are going to do the visits that we expect to do um, for to to our parents, and uh, we're going to enjoy a, a family with the children and and another family that are going to come to visit. So no plans change for us. But many of your members, Michael, will report. I'm sure that many people are changing their plans. Footfall is down across the hospitality industry, across restaurants and pubs. So I guess in some senses, Chris Whitty's advice, Her Majesty the Queen's advice, or certainly her example, is hitting home and a lot of the country are, as Gloria says, reining it in. Uh, look, I, I think everyone has seen over the last two weeks, starting with Jenny Herries' uh, comments around socialisation, uh, and the very uh, sort of uh, despairing uh, press conference last night where uh, the, uh, the the narrative was about, uh, you know, being careful, socialising and, and the contradictory comments from the PM, which sort of balanced it out. Uh, it just really resonates with the mixed messages that we've seen uh, for the last two weeks and the fact that the Omicron variant um, has, uh, on, on top of that, presented another layer of concern um, the customer confidence has, has obviously dropped. And, and without a doubt, from that point two weeks ago, we saw a considerable drop in uh, uh, in bookings over the period and some concern. And now we're starting to see a resonating position leading to this weekend where we're going to see the impacts of the new Plan B restrictions, which we're all trying to wrestle with and understand exactly what the expectations are in terms of government, but also with regard to the authorities who are going to be enforcing this uh, uh, particularly over the weekend, which is the busiest weekend of the Christmas period. And if you are being hurt by the guidance, do you need the government to step in with support? I think everyone recognises that the, the three weeks of this year, the golden quarter, which is this is part of, um, you know, we rely heavily on it so that we can survive 2022, particularly the early parts of the year. So the frustration from our perspective is this narrative of concern, narrative that is presenting a lack of confidence amongst customers um, is, uh, you know, hitting our industry considerably. We're seeing 30 to 40 percent drop in trade. Uh, I'm getting a continual barrage of messages and texts and concern. So without a doubt, as we've seen in Scotland, where they are offering 100 million pounds worth of support, we need the Chancellor to step up and, and consider the hospitality and nighttime economy position and look to support that industry as well, because we are moving to a space where we really are uh, in a pseudo lockdown position particularly as we're also anticipating that staff are going to start to uh, be challenged by the pandemic situation as we extend the isolation period to 10 days.
Michael Kill, CEO of the Nighttime Industries Association. All the best to you and your members during this difficult trading period. We're delighted now to be joined by Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School, Dr. Bharat Pankania. Good to see you. Have you changed your pre-Christmas plans in order to save Christmas Day, as the Queen has, as Chris Whitty suggested we should? Yes, I did this, and I did this a uh, long time ago, as soon as uh, remember, I'm in the business. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I love to take my medical students out. I have my tutorial groups and I love to take them out. And uh, we agreed that this wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be the good thing to do. So I have said to them, come the new year, we will have a garden party at my home instead. With regards to family gatherings, etc., I love to have lots of people at my home too. And for the second year running, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Dr. Pankaria, we've had many discussions with you on our show, Gloria and I, over recent months. It's always good to see you. You often talk about your students at Exeter University Medical School there. They're clearly very important to you, that part of your academic yes. life. To what extent do you think we're in danger that come the new year, universities won't go back to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Do you think we are now in that territory again? I hope not, and my reasons are as follows. So when we were in uh, the lockdown situation, uh, I sat on the top table at the University of Exeter working out our preparedness plans of how to deliver this very well. And come uh, September, when the medical school term started, we've been delivering face to face and we've been successfully delivering our teaching. So I feel come 2022, the plan that we put in place uh, has shown to be working and therefore we, we have all plans to continue with our face to face teaching in the new year. And as you said, you are indeed in the business. So what is it? What, is, what have you seen that has led you to scale back those pre-Christmas gatherings that you'd planned? So this is a really important question, and I'm really grateful that you ask it, because it goes as follows. So people will tell you that it is a mild disease-causing variant. I accept that, most possibly. On the other hand, the trouble with it is that if it is highly infectious, number one, and number two, the evidence that it may be bypassing the vaccines that we've been immunized with, then we have a problem. The problem is at a population level. At an individual level, people may get infected, get better, fine. But at a big population level, we will get a small percentage who become seriously ill in a short period of time with a rising tide of infections. And when that happens, even a 0.2 or 0.5% of say 10 million people is a large number suddenly, suddenly needing hospital care, hospital attention, and some people will die. So that is the mathematical modeling of mild, but very infectious and vaccine bypassing. What would you do in that case? Avoid getting exposed. And avoid getting exposed equals reducing your human-to-human -human interactions. Dr. Barrett Pankania of the University of Exeter Medical Tour, thanks as ever for joining us here on GB News. We're delighted to be joined now by psychologist Emma Kenny. Emma, it is Christmas party season, but is anyone partying? Are you partying in the run-up? <laughs> Well, I come from quite a northern working class area where we just kind of are living our lives and trying to get back to normal because that's good for mental health and also because what are we going to do? Just take the example that was said there, a mild illness that is very contagious. I'm not a medic, clearly, but I do know that that would equivocate a cold. And of course, colds spread quickly. They have done for a very long time. If we're going to lock ourselves up and away from people because there's a cold going around because it could affect certain people as it will do 
past, present, future, then we may as well accept that we're never going to get back to normal. And for mental and physical health, one of the most important things is to be around people that we love and spend time with them. And also, one of the most powerful things that we all need to have a discussion about in the UK and Western world is our really poor acknowledgement of mortality. We are going to die. There is a point in our life when we get old and vulnerable, or also, unfortunately, if we really don't take care of our health, and therefore we put ourselves more at risk, that there's a conversation we need to have about firstly, looking after our mental and physical health better, and secondly, accepting that we don't live eternally, nor should we wish to. That's what gives life meaning. So I think that on the medical level, we keep getting sent these facts and numbers and statistics, and it sounds really scary when you do that. But if you stop and just go logically and say, well, actually what we're saying is you have a poor connection with the fact that we're not going to live forever, and that's okay. My God, should it teach us one thing? Yes, it should. Make sure that you live in the present around people that you share your lives with and loves with, and that you take every moment as a mini miracle of your experience on this momentary experience that you have on this planet of consciousness. That's the reality, and no one's talking about it. So my Christmas plans are not going to change at all, nor are my Christmas bookings. I'm going to support the hospitality industry. I'm not going to support anyone that puts in vaccine passports. They're discriminatory, prejudicial, and after being a woman in our society and fighting for equality for a long time, I'm not giving it up. But apart from that, I'll be supporting everybody and anybody who wants to engage with me because I'm a human animal and I require other human animals to be alive, essentially, because it makes me feel well and happy. Emma, I guess then you'd agree with uh, Chris Whitty himself, who said just a couple of weeks ago, if there was another full lockdown, given that we've had a big taste of freedom since July 2021, Freedom Day, it might be hard to take the public with us. That's what he said to the local government association. On the other hand, we do have to adhere to the law, don't we? What, what are you going to do if the government says, well, we are going to lock down? I mean, with the best will in the world, a lot of people will agree with your sentiment there, and it's a, a wonderful sentiment, but they will in the end adhere to the law. I mean, I don't live in a totalitarian, tyrannical state. I live in a democracy. They're there to serve me, not for me to serve them. I think that 3.5% of the population is all it requires to say no to a government, and that will end the situations and sanctions that they're putting on us. It's already been shown that people are going to court and not being fined because they've not been considered as lawful. Also, I think that we have to counter the reality of what we're being told by those individuals with their actions, which were to break all their rules consistently. So no, I'm not going to accept lockdowns because they're terrible for us. And the evidence is that poor minority groups in particular have been so badly affected that it's going to take aeons for them to ever get to a point where they have the equity that they had prior to this. Secondly, are we going to accept living in a police state forever? Because believe me, there's going to be lots and lots of variants. And are we ever going to accept that as human beings, we don't actually have to ask for our freedom? I'm not a prisoner. Neither are you. Neither are any of us. We're not prisoners. We're free human beings. All this the polling suggests that the government, that all the polling on this suggests that the public are heartily in favour of the Plan B restrictions, which cause such a hoo-ha. But I mean, mm. in, in most people's view, are quite quite limited. And the anecdotal evidence, I mean, certainly my own life, is that I was supposed to be at a party tomorrow night. The post of that party is cancelled. I was going to have people over on, on Sunday, and I said, well, what do you think? And they said, probably, actually, it's not a good idea. So I'm just prioritising. I think, I think I'm yeah, more, I mean, more I've, representative. I've never lived my life think, I've never really lived my life thinking about what people are going to give me permission to do. I, I live my life thinking about the people that I care for and the communities that I serve. And right now, so the, the poor parents communities on Christmas that Day. are pretty much the... Are you seeing so your elderly okay. parents on Christmas Day? Are you so sadly, uh, my dad died two years ago, but my mother is just coming up for 80, and absolutely, I'm seeing her on Christmas Day. I couldn't imagine anything worse than keeping an elderly person isolated in her own home, but absolutely. obviously, everybody's got absolutely. a different subjective experience. And, and yeah. the argument well, is... Northern, so Northern people tend to have that kind of mentality. I'm Northern. Respect, I'm from Bradford, darling. Um, but, <laughs> no, but the no, argument no. is that Chris Whitty's is making is that because we all want to see our yeah. older mums and <clears throat> obviously, sorry about your dad, but, you know, those lucky enough to still have both parents, that we should rein it in for, for them so we can save Christmas well, we Day. Remaining, and... Yeah, I mean, 
I'm witty. We've been raining it in for you for two years, my love. So it's a no from me in that respect. And also, I'm not trying to be glib about this. What I'm trying to say is, look, people followed the guidance. I adhered to every rule and regulation. Not that the press would have had you believe that. They made out I was doing all sorts of things. It's not true. I just adhered to every rule and regulation. But nonetheless, as time has progressed, and I've worked with people who are suicidal, who communities that are feeling broken apart, poverty beyond belief rising, child mortality going through the roof, head injuries of young people in hospital going through the roof, and so on and so forth, domestic homicide going through the roof. We know our society cannot handle another lockdown for different reasons, not just the glib experience of I want to see people. This is more of a socio-political issue. The other thing is, people have had their vaccines. They're being told to have a third vaccine. So, OK, you're going to have it one way or the other. You either say vaccines are working, therefore get on with your life, hence why they're meant to be bringing in VPs, or you say, you know what, vaccines aren't working, they've not worked at all, what are we going to do? Well, either way, you're going to lose at a government level. Either stop the vaccine programme or Emma, accept that they've worked and get people out there. Emma Kenny, thanks for that. Emma Kenny, psychologist, joining us here on GB Views. Just got some time for some of your views. You've been emailing us. Peter says, if a wider range of scientific opinion was sought, then I would be more confident. Liz says, what about the thousands of UK citizens who were going skiing for Christmas with the families, friends in France? UK tour operators will lose millions and families will lose their Christmas holiday. Tim says, I'm not changing any of my Christmas plans. I may reconsider if we start seeing seriously ill people with COVID. David says, I live on my own and will not be spending another Christmas on my own. I'll be travelling to London from Devon next week and spending Christmas with my family. Peter says, given we had to cancel Christmas last year, we've decided to stay at home and cancel our pre-Christmas social events till Christmas Day in order to protect our family Christmas lunch. I'm with you. You've also been voting in our Twitter poll throughout the show. 8% said yes to are you changing your plans for Christmas because of the Omicron variant, while 92% said no, that they are not. You've been watching DePiero and Halligan on GB News. After the break, it's the briefing with Darren McCaffrey. But first, here's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and um, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland, so a bit damp and drizzly here. But otherwise, as I said, the vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight, under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally, where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. Generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, Monday to Thursday from 4pm till 6pm. We don't lecture to you or try to tell you what to think. We do a deep delve into a topic with views from across the range of debate, therefore leaving you, the viewer, to make up your own mind. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, 4 till 6, Monday to Thursday.
you're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Very good afternoon. Welcome to the briefing PM. Coming up in the next hour, hospitality in crisis due to cancellations around the pandemic. What are you planning to do ahead of Christmas? France banning UK tourists. Should the Prime Minister face a leadership challenge? And also record numbers of people getting boosters. That and so much more between three and four. But first, at the top of the hour, the news. Good afternoon, I'm Tamsin Roberts. The top story is at three o'clock. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to a rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those who can enter will have to self-isolate for seven days but can leave isolation after 48 hours if they receive a negative PCR test. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. Orange Travel had its best October sales ever, best sales ever for a month, and then it all came to a bit of a halt. Um, business has been great.